Uh, well, this morning's message, uh, I've titled today's message, Deal or No Deal. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen that TV program, program that they've just brought back, you know, Howie Mandel there. And, 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 and what's the idea behind that program? You know, you got a, a number of cases that are there that are the, the gals are holding up on the stage and, and the contestant comes up to the stage there and he, he selects, he chooses one of those cases hoping that he's made the right selection and that he puts it on his little tabletop there and then the game begins and he hopes that he has selected the case with a million dollars in it, right? And, and all the other selections that he's making across the, uh, you know, the, the, the course of this game, you know, it's... He's, he's doing this in good faith, but in hoping that he can get the best deal, deal or no deal. And so God speaks to us perhaps in some of the same ways, deal or no deal. Uh, God has something very special for us. He has salvation for us. He has the forgiveness of sins for us. But will we trade our suitcase of sin for his suitcase of salvation? Freely trade. Will you trade that? Will I trade that? Will I forsake him in that? Or will I stay consistent with him in, 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 in just knowing that he has my best interest at heart? Well, we've gone this far in the book of Romans, and as we've come through everything that we've seen in the previous eight chapters here in Romans, Paul he has, has done a wonderful job at shaping all of this, and he's been so consistent, and it's been very, 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 very simple to follow the logical thought processes as Paul has laid them out. And yet we came to the last time that we were together here, um, a couple weeks back here when I taught the first few verses of Romans 9, and we entered into a train wreck. It was like, oh, what happened? How did we get here in this particular chapter? Well, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, these are very difficult chapters to teach. But what Paul started off with at the very beginning of chapter 9 is, is that he started off with this heart. He started off with a heart that was for his countrymen. And the irony of what he said in verse number three is, he said, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh. That what Paul was saying is, is man, I tell you, I, I would love to suffer on their behalf if they would just come to salvation, if they would just embrace Jesus by faith. And we know that as he shared that, totally ironic. Why? Because Jesus had already died for that. Because Jesus had already paid the price. Because Jesus has already offered salvation. And in, in, in what he's addressing here in chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, he is dealing with the Jews. He's dealing with the unbelief or the rejection of Christ by the Jews. And if we could at least say this for chapter 9, chapter 9 is something where he kind of turns it and he looks to the past. He looks historically with the Jews. And so, as he continues on looking historical, he gets into verses 4 or 5. Uh, again, these are verses that we covered last, last time. But as he goes through those verses, what Paul does is he lays out seven particular benefits that the Jews had. And he's bringing this right back to the forefront because his care, his concern for them was that they would not forget what God has done on their behalf already. And, 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 and maybe I should just say right here for us this morning, listen, gang, may we not forget what God has done for us already. Because God has done an amazing work. You know, in just a couple weeks from now, we're going to celebrate, you know, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And we will gather here, and we will lift our hands, and we will pray. And then, and, 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 and I pray by the Spirit of God that there will be an element of excitement here because of the resurrection of Christ. That resurrection of what Christ has done and him laying his life down and suffering and, and, and being able to take it up again and, and, and what that means to us. It's certain. It's unmovable. The salvation that we have been given is, is not something that can be taken away from us. And so the seven benefits that Paul gives here, what he's reminding the Jews of, uh, I'll rattle them off here. He says, you guys are Israelites. He says, you know, quite simply, he says, you guys are blessed again because you had Hebrew parents. That was it. And you know what? It is a, it's a huge blessing. If there's anybody in here that has been raised in a Christian home, I want to tell you, you do not know what a, a tremendous blessing that is to be raised in a Christian home, to where love and fairness and kindness and, and, and a seeking of the living God is something that is put forward. It's, it's powerful. And, and that reminder, you know, again, in like kind, Paul's saying, he says, listen, you guys are Israelites, man. Your parents were Hebrews. And he says... 
He goes on down. He says, to whom pertain the adoption? And remember the last time that we looked at this, adoption was nothing more than God claimed them as his kids. God claimed them as his sons. He says, glory. What is this? This is God's presence in their nation, that the glory of God, uh, we'll remember in the Old Testament that, that God's Shekinah glory was there in the temple. Uh, and, and that every time they moved in the Exodus, you know, he would go before them by day and before them at night, you know, he'd, from a pillar of fire to a cloud and, and all of this stuff. And so God's presence was there with them. And so too, we know that, that the New Testament tells us in the book of Hebrews that God will not leave us and he will not forsake us, speaking to the church. So wherever we go, God is there. And he goes on down to the covenants, you know, the Abrahamic, the Davidic covenant, uh, the law, what's that all about, right? You know, the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we saw that this was a way that God was just putting forth justice in society. Wow, That's, you know, when we think about that today, justice in society, and, and, and there's, a, there's a real solid anchor in terms of what God established. The service of God and then the promises. The promises had to do with nothing more than the regathering of Israel as a nation and the new covenant that was going to come in the future, in the days to come. And so Paul goes through all of these wonderful benefits, everything that is there. But the big struggle was this, is because in spite of all of this stuff, in spite of all of these things, in spite of Paul having a heart which was iconic or reflective of, of the heart of Christ to save, and, and in spite of all these little things here in this, this list of seven, if you will, in spite of all of this, what plagued the nation of Israel? What plagued the Jews? It was unbelief. And sin, the sin of unbelief, it dulled their senses towards God. And gang, the same thing can happen towards us, is that, is that the sin of unbelief can come in, it can dull our senses towards God. It can dull our senses towards the, the consciousness, the awareness of God's presence within our life. That we can get to this spot as the enemy of our soul is to beat us down and to push us back. And sometimes... Even our own stubborn refusal to believe what God has done can leave us lingering in a place of unbelief, and God doesn't want that. God wants us to remember the faithful promises that he has given. God wants us to always come back, to, stir, to have our pure minds stirred up by way of reminder so that we would know the certainty of the salvation that we have given, that he has been given to us, and that we would know the great magnitude of God's love for us that he has a plan and he has a purpose for our life. And so Paul is sharing all of this stuff and he's trying to bring their minds back to this. He's trying to give them the understanding of this because God had been at work on their behalf. Well, he goes a little bit farther and, and, and maybe I should just, uh, perhaps just, maybe I can just add this as, a, as a, uh, a historical commentary here, if you will. Because we know that, that really from the inception of the world, and we go back to the Garden of Eden and we begin to work our way down here to this present hour, that historically that God has been reaching out to man. God has been looking for man. God is, you know, we have in the, in the Gospel of John that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And so what has he done historically? Historically, he's revealed himself in creation, right? The scriptures tell us that, that all of creation declare his majesty. Creation does that. It declares God's majesty. Listen, when you're out in the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna use a phrase for myself, when I'm out in the woods taking my, uh, uh, my sons and my grandson hunting, new hunters, by the way, I'm not that good at it. It's been a lot of time. Don't always come away with anything good, but I tell you, I see a few squirrels along the way or something. <laughs> But I'm telling you, when you're out there in the middle of the woods and you're miles away from everything and all of a sudden you look up into that night, it is stinking amazing to get out of the presence of the light that is down here from street lights to stop lights to whatever lights and to be in, into a place to where you're, you're just, you're surrounded by the trees. You hear the streams in the, in the distance. But when you look up, man, what you see when you look up is still just as fascinating is what the scriptures declare about it. You know, the, the heavens declare God's majesty. Amazing. Well, historically, God has gone on farther than that. Why? Because he's revealed his character. Again, just like what they had, they had the law, the Ten Commandments. Well, we know that in the Ten Commandments, again, God reveals his character through the laws of Moses. That was the basis of justice in society. God laid it out. Again, historically, what has happened? As we've gone through the annals of time, we know this, that God has spoken to the nations and even to us here today 
through the prophets and the apostles. So we've seen that historical work that God has done. And then all of that work, as as the scriptures declares all of these particular things, we come all the way up to the time here in more recent history, if you will, that that, that we find, uh, 2,000 years ago, recent history, okay? Just, yeah, it's just like yesterday, right? (laughs) Some of you are going, it feels like yesterday. (laughs) Yes. But, but, but God, he sent his son to the earth, right? The long-awaited savior that was prophesied about in the Old Testament, that Jesus comes, he shows up on the scene. And as Paul opens up the book of Romans, all the way back in Romans 1 and 16, if you're in your Bible, why don't you just flip there so you can see with your old eyeballs. Uh, Romans 1 and 16, as, as Paul is getting the introduction part going to the book of Romans, he says, listen, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not, Paul? He says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. He lists out Jews and he lists out Gentiles, both. For everybody that believes, it's the power of God to salvation. When I understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, then I understand the heart of God. I understand what he's offered to me. And as Paul gets now to to Romans 9, 10, 11, He has been so systematical in this thing as as he's broken uh, out the direction of God, as he's he's given us this wonderful doctrine. He's bringing all things up to a culminating point. But but as he's worked through these first eight chapters here, he has talked about what, um, what the gospel does in terms of bringing salvation. He shares with us those that are in need of salvation, the secular man, the moral man, the religious man. He lays out everybody that is in need of the gospel. The whole world is in need of what God has done. But chapters 9 through 11, what happens? It's like it's, like it's been so smooth. Oh, everything that I've just shared with you so far has been so easy. It's all rolled off the tongue. It's been so simple. And yeah, we can get the amens and maybe a clap or two. And yeah, I'm with you, pastor. Yeah, that's easy. Well, you ain't with me. You're with Paul. You know, you're with the Lord. That's his words, not mine. I'm just summarizing it. Piece of cake. But chapter nine, it goes off the rails. Nine, 10, 11. It's like, what just happened? I don't understand. The things that you're writing now are hard to understand. It's like my brain is breaking down here. Because he goes to this place to where he introduces, you know, predestination and election. You know, predestination would be the big picture, um, uh, you know, as to God's choice and and, and as it it pertains to election. Election would would focus down more specifically towards the believers and it would become something much more positive, if you will. But he begins to talk about this stuff. Charles Swindoll, in his commentary on this portion of Romans, he says this. He writes about chapters 9, 10, 11 of Romans. He says... He says, I will admit that this section of Paul's letter to the Romans contains mysteries I have no ability to unravel. And I would say, oh, amen. (laughs) Because when I taught the first six verses of this thing, I about crashed. Now, you may not have thought I crashed because, you know, maybe you're not reading what I was reading, but I crashed. It It was rough. And I'm hoping... I'm clinging to the altar of mercy up here. God help me through the next three chapters because I'm looking forward to chapter 12. (laughs) It's going to be beautiful. (laughs) In the meantime, we suffer. (laughs) Oh, wow. But let us remember this, uh, that, that by the time that Paul gets here to write the book of Romans, okay, by this time, we know where he's sending the letter to. We, we, we know all of that. We've covered all that. But by the time that he writes this, most of the Jews has, have already rejected Christ. They've already rejected the plan of, of um, salvation. Uh, you know, their thoughts were that, that God was going to send a political or a military figure to set things in order immediately that, at that particular time. And so, you know, they pushed this whole thing off. It's like, ah. You know, they, they've completely lost hope. And, and you know, uh, right along with that, you know, they kicked Jesus to the curb and said, you know, hey, this ain't the way. I mean, this poor dude is this poor carpenter guy. We know him. We know, we know where he comes from. No. And they rejected it. And so if you're taking notes, maybe you'd strike this down because we may not say this again. And, and I know it will be difficult for me to teach as we go. But chapter 9 deals with the sovereignty of God. Okay, if, if you want to summarize the chapter in, in a couple words, there it is, the sovereignty of God, done. Chapter 10, it deals with the justice of God. 
And chapter 11 deals with the faithfulness of God. Now let's just say amen right there and call the worship team back up. We'll, we'll pick up again in chapter 12. <laughs> so all these things are there, okay? But as, as, as Paul takes this chapter and he covers the sovereignty of God again, what is he doing? He's introducing truths. We got predestination, or more specifically, moving down towards election. And I want to give you four things in this, okay? Uh, point number one is that uh, if, I, if I could use the phrase loosely, predesti predestination or maybe even election, listen, it begins with God's choice, okay? Yes. Verses 6 down to 13. Let me read a few of those verses there. Uh, picking up in verse number 6, Paul says, he says, But it is not uh, that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But as it says, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Period. We'll stop right there. Okay, so, so in the, the, the picture of just trying to extract a, a high-level understanding here, you know, we, we must understand that, listen, the choice begins with God, that God is the one that is making the choice. He gives us the examples here in these few verses. You know, he talks about Isaac. He talks about Jacob. He talks about these, uh, you know, these different historical uh, characters and figures and real-life people that, that the Jews would know about. But as you and I survey across this, we must understand that the prescription or the perspective that he's giving is going back to a historical perspective. And in that perspective, he starts there nor towards the beginning the, in the book of Genesis. And, and he's speaking of what God chose to do. And he uses Abraham. Who is Abraham? Abraham is the father of faith. Everything that Paul is, is, is writing about and trying to bring the people to is so that they would have faith in Christ. Not that they would have faith in the works of their own hands or keeping a particular set of religious processes or codes, but they would have faith in Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and everything in this is geared towards faith. And part of that faith is understanding that, listen, that, that, that choice begins with God. God chose. God did not honor the works of Abraham's flesh because, because he had a promise from God. And what did Abraham try to do? He tried to fulfill that. And he did that with Hagar, right? And they end up having Ishmael, uh, Sarah's maidservant, okay? And so, so that failure point there, if you will, as we read through the book of Genesis, God doesn't acknowledge Ishmael as anything, the work of the flesh. He doesn't acknowledge that as being part of the promise. But he absolutely does acknowledge Isaac, that, that, that this is it, that this is the work of God, this is the choice of God, this is what God is doing. And, and, and Abraham was to receive it by faith, even though he was delayed by 25 years from embracing that specific promise, even though it took that long before it came to pass, a long time. Verse 10 says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, oh, there's a little tag word, might stand, and not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So, so here it is, right? Isaac, you know, through Rebekah has the two sons, Jacob and Esau, uh, Esau uh, he, they're the two guys. But, but right there from the womb, where is the selection made? Where is the choice made? God made the choice. It wasn't man that was making the choice. God made the choice. So we must understand that, that predestination or election, if I can put those two, uh, sometimes predestined and election are, are kind of tied together just generically, if you will. More specifically, as we dive deeper, again, one more time, election is, is, is most often referred to as, uh, you know, the, the, the chosen people of God, uh, God being uh, electing, you know, even you and I, okay? So it's more specific in a, in a positive light, if you will. But the emphasis is all around choice. Uh, now, let me say this, uh, and maybe this is just nothing more than a side note for some, 
that uh, what is quoted here in verse number 13, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Okay, this is, this is taken out of Malachi chapter one, verses two and three, okay? It's a little extended phrase out of there. And here's what I wanna add as a side note, because I've had this come up in men's study in, 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 um, you know, through, the, through the course of my walk with the Lord. I've had people stumble over this. How can God hate? He's supposed to be a God of love. How can he hate? Well, yes, it is written as hate in our English Bibles, but when we go back to uh, the historical um, ancient days in Eastern culture and all that stuff, listen, the, the word hate here uh, is not the same as you and I would see it. It, 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 it carries a totally different flavor here. Uh, the flavor behind this is all about the priority, watch, here it is again, the priority of choice. Miss Pam, you just caught my eye. Welcome back and good to see you. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny the way things happen. <laughs> yes. I'm excited that you're here now. I'm distracted, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> so it all begins with choice. And so, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, the hate side there, if you will, it's, it's a priority of choice. It's not emotions. Uh, maybe that's what I should say. It's not about emotions. Okay, listen, when you get mad, you start hating on somebody and all that, well, what's, what's happening behind the scenes? Oh, there's a high level of emotions going on. That's not what this is about. That's not what he's saying. You know, Jacob I have loved, but, but Esau I have hated. It, it's not about emotions, it's choice. And these, these verses, 6 to 13, that's the only thing that he's amplifying is choice. Okay? And so we move on down to the second point here. And that second point is, is that, you know, predestination, again, using that loosely, it shows God's character, verses 14 to 18. Here's what it says. It says, what should we say then? Question mark. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. And so then... It is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be de uh, declared in all the earth. Okay, this second point. This shows God's character. Why does it show God's character? Because grace is a gift. And, and because grace is a gift, guess what that means? Listen, I was trying to auction off a highlighter here today. <laughs> deal or no deal, okay? A green highlighter. This is going to go good in my Bible. I know it is. It's going to work good. It's not too, you know, sometimes you get a highlighter that's too juicy and it like messes up your page. This is a good one. <laughs> what does that have to do with God's character? Nothing. Okay. Ah. But because he's the giver of, of grace, because he's the one that gives it, he has the right to offer it or he's got the right to withhold it. There's no way to earn it. That's his point. You can't earn this. This is of God. And so, so what does God do? God demonstrates grace and mercy. We have an example here in this. You know, he's showing two men's life. He's showing Pharaoh. He's showing Moses here. Okay, this is the historical perspective. This is him going back to the past, and he's laying this stuff out here. And so the first thing that we have here is that when we look at Moses and we look at Pharaoh, we see two guys. We see two guys that God offered something to, but as we look at both of these guys, each one of these dudes had an opportunity to humble themselves, okay? Uh, Moses had that opportunity, you'll remember with me, around the burning bush and so forth, that, that there Moses in Exodus chapter three, that man, God got his attention, he humbled himself. Now as we move forward in Exodus, we get to Exodus chapter five, and we find that, that, that Moses is bringing in a message to Pharaoh about his people and what to do, and God you know, expressing what he wanted to you know, show his power and, and such and such. Long story short, that, that, that Pharaoh didn't humble himself. He didn't respond to what that was. He pushed off of it, okay? And we see that struggle happen. Okay, so, so again, this is all about showing God's character. Second thing that we find under this is that, listen, each man, be it Moses or be it Pharaoh, they had a response. They had an opportunity according to their individual choice to respond to what God's gift was, to respond to what God's grace was, to respond to what God wanted to do. They had the opportunity to respond. Uh, Exodus 9 and 34, I, I have a note here on this. I don't know what the verse says, but I figured if I wrote it down, it's got to be a good verse. 
Exodus 9.34, what does it say? Uh, Exodus 9.34 says, And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. Okay, I, I see what my thoughts were. Is that even though God was trying to capture his attention, and early on, God offered him something, you know, hey, let my people go, okay? You know, I, uh, this is a good gift here for you. He went on, and he continued to vacillate between two choices. Yes, he is God, and let him go. Oh, what? The, no, we're not going to let him go. And then the plagues come again and all this stuff. And so Exodus 9 and 34, it just shows that continual vacillation. It shows the continual aspect of him choosing, but what his choice was is moving against God every time. And it moves into the third point here, verses 19 down through 22, and there's a magnification that will come out of this, this part right here. Take a look at this, verse 19. He says, Paul writes, he says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Question mark. For who has resisted his will? Question mark. Indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay? From the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So as we look at this third particular point here of, uh, in verses 19 to 22 about God showing his mercy, predestination shows God's mercy. Listen, uh, we know this as we read through the book of, of Jeremiah, specifically chapters 18 and 19. We see the potter and the clay, and, and we, you know, we, we see uh, Jeremiah penning that story and everything. Uh, we know very specifically that God can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. There is none like him. And every way that he acts is a just way. And every way that he acts is in a loving way. Everything that he does is awesome. Even his judgments, they're awesome. But he allowed Pharaoh to choose. That Pharaoh had a choice within that process the same way that you and I have a, a choice. And, and, and it was these choices that Pharaoh made that ended up shaping his life. And what did God do? God only made firm, firm through the, the segment of choices that he continued to make, this area of unbelief as he continued to go back. Oh yeah, God is, and then he would go this way. And through all of those choices, through the segment and the seasons of his life, through that, every one of those things shaped who he was as a man rejecting God. And God only made firm what his decisions were. Verse 22, this is, this is the amplification of all that vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. That's the phrase right there in verse 22. Okay, in the original language, it's important that you understand this so that we can wrap our minds around all of these things because of all these great debates that like to come up and if God is so just, then how can he do this? How can he make this guy's heart hard in this way? And I knew that God, he's, he's just up there looking to take out my legs. I knew he's mean and evil. Now, nonsense, hogwash, as someone has once said. That, that, not even the case. In verse 22, Paul adds that magnification because as he's, again, he is writing to the Israelites or to the Jews, I should say, okay, at this stage. He's, he's, he's writing, he's trying to capture their attention and, and he's trying to show that God is a just God. He's trying to show uh, the sovereignty of God. And so at the end of verse 22, he says, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Here's what this means. Here's the flavor in the original language. This is all about a response. It's, 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 it's a response to a repetition of choice. We read it as though, okay, God created these guys to be wiped out. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's great English reading. That's good taking away from the English version of it, but it has nothing to do with what the text means. What the text means in the original Greek language as it is originally written, as the scholars tell us, this verse 22, it pours in the whole understanding of some of these things that we've been walking through. And if we miss this, if we're only trying to take it out of our English Bibles, we're not going to catch the flavor of it because it's like, it's not going to make sense to us. So this vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, it is a response it is God responding, watch, to all the choices an individual has made to reject God through their life, which will in the end result in devastation. God is only giving what the individual has chosen along the way. Thus, 
We go back to the big example of Pharaoh as Pharaoh vacillated back and forth, back and forth. And then every time he chose to jockey to the left or to the right away from God, God made his heart hard, it says. He just, he allowed him to make that choice. He allowed him to make that choice. He allowed him to make that choice. And over the segment of time, the choices that were made within his life came up to this place, much like what we see here in verse 22, is that these are vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. They are just confirmed by the lifelong series of choices that are made. And now we come to a huge place to preach the gospel. Because if you're sitting in here this morning, or maybe you're watching on live stream, or maybe you'll listen on the radio in the days to come, please understand that in all avenues, all seasons, all areas of your life, that God is calling out to you. He's calling out to you. God wants to give you something awesome. God wants to forgive you of your sin. God wants to bring you into a more glorious inheritance. God wants to do, God has done, and God wants to do, and he wants to do it for you and I. But the rejection of what we do when we push off the counsel of God or we push off the word of God, or, or, or here's another more popular one. Watch this. Um, this, is, this is just an, an illustration, okay? So I'm not saying like kind. I'm stepping off of the like kind and I'm moving into an illustration. Like this, that people think today that I can get my Jesus on by reading a book, by watching a sermon, by staying and seeing things online. We love you live streamers, but we are asking that you, if, if there's a church in your area, get attached to that church in that area, okay? You need to be a part of people because you can't go through the Christian life, a walk with God, thinking that you're going to deepen your love for Christ and for others by just watching stuff online and just by reading books. You need somebody else to rub up against you. And when we push off of that counsel, we step away from that, we, we make a decision. And that decision affects us. And it, it is the collection of decisions that ends up shaping our lives for good or for bad. God has good for you. But you know what? You know, perhaps we're going to stand before, actually not perhaps, we are going to stand before the Lord to give account for what we have done with the gifts that God has given to us. One of the amazing gifts that God has given to us, you know, aside from Jesus, is the words of Jesus. It's the word of God. And the word of God tells us how to live. And because God's word tells us how to live, we can understand, looking forward to chapter 12, by the way, the, <laughs> the expectation or the response of what God is calling us to. God is calling us to a response. I hope that makes sense because I'm getting hot up here. Whew. We got to move on. I don't know how. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Let me just uh, let me just say that the, the, the mercy of God is long suffering. But in that, He also gives room for a person to make choices as well, just like He did with Pharaoh. So we come down to the fourth and final point, verses 23 to 33 here. I'm not going to read all these verses. Um, well, maybe I will read them. Uh, we'll do them in segments, though. Verse 23. He says, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, who he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. A question mark there. Hmm. Not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? And he leaves it hanging with a question, right? We can read that almost like, well, that's a statement, and I just, you know, it fits my theology. Well, it does fit good theology, but, but notice he frames it as a question right there. The Gentiles? Can God even do that with the Gentiles? Huh, are we sure about this? So predestination, it shows God's fairness too. In these verses 23 to 24, what, is, what happens? God uses the passing of time to separate the elect from the non-elect. How so? Well, there are some people that are still in rebellion to God. Listen, if you would roll back to the time of my birth there in the early 70s, um, actually, let me rephrase that, in, 19, in, the, in, in 1971, at my, the age of my birth, and then you would take from 1971 and you would carry it forward all the way to 1993, that segment of my life right in there, I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have salvation. None of that stuff. And my heart was so hard against God, and yet I believe that God has chosen me. And in, in, on May 7th of 1993, at about 8 o'clock at nighttime, there with a gun in my mouth, a 9-millimeter 
uh, Glock 17 in my mouth, ready to take my life because I'm tired of, of my sin and I'm tired of running, that God does something amazing and he forgives me of my sins and he brings me in and, and, and he washes me of all of my sins and he does something awesome. And it has been through the passing of that time that God has continued to establish his wonderful gift of salvation through this process of sanctification, of just walking out day by day, of learning what it's like to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so God uses his fairness. It shows that through the passing of time that the elect from the non-elect, he uses time to separate. Let's give another biblical example. Tell with, or, or remember with me, not tell me, but remember with me in the book of Acts, who was the guy that was breathing threats and murders against the early church? It was Saul, right? Saul who later became Paul there, Acts chapter nine on the Damascus road, right? The conversion happened at that point. And now we're studying, you know, the book of Romans in which God used Paul to write. Amazing. So again, the predestination, using that word loosely, it shows God's fairness. And the passing of time separates the elect from the non-elect. And even those perhaps that are maybe in this room today or maybe watching online or, or, or maybe involved in some other area of your life that you may know of. Listen, me, there might be people that are still in rebellion to God that are yet to get saved. And when that last Gentile is saved, it's over, man. We're, we're rapture express right out of here. Okay, we're waiting for that. So if you're here today, get saved so we can go home. <laughs> we'll have to go through another election stuff. You know, we're done. Let's get out of here. Man, that's the fairness of God. Okay, verses 25 to 29, he, he pens this. He says, he says, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not beloved and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Awesome. Okay, uh, put, your, put your scholar cap on for a second because I know I can lose you super easily on this because if I can lose myself, I know it's easy to lose you. <laughs> okay, so think with me for just a second. Okay, we have in verse 25, he starts out in the, in, in the very first line there, Hosea. Okay, so we have Hosea the prophet. Now we go down to verse 27 and also verse 29. Who's the guy that I have right there? You tell me in your Bible, what does it say? Isaiah. Isaiah. So I've got two historical people here. Okay, I'm dealing with Hosea and I'm dealing with Isaiah. What is this a representation of? This is a history lesson, folks. It is dealing with the northern and the southern kingdom. Okay, uh, Judah was labeled the southern kingdom where Isaiah prophesied, okay? Isaiah prophesied in the southern kingdom. Now, in the southern kingdom, we know that as we scroll through history there, that the southern kingdom had a better mix than what the northern kingdom had because there were some faithful kings that rose up through the chorus of time. Now, in the northern kingdom, who, uh, which is, is, is titled Israel, okay? That's the northern kingdom that Hosea prophesied there. We know that when we look up in the north, we know that uh, there was not one good king that came out, that everybody was in rebellion. But the idea between uh, Hosea and Isaiah, between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, between uh, Israel up north and Judah in the south, okay, between all of that, the whole thing is nothing more than this, is that God is faithful to save a small remnant, and that's exactly what he did. It was those that responded by faith to him that came out of these. And these are what the prophecy of Hosea and the prophecy of Isaiah is showing, that there were some that came out of that. Amazing. And then we get down into the closing verses, verses 30 to 33. He says this. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? This is like mind blowing to them. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And he closes the chapter that way. Amazing. That Paul takes this and he expands God's mercy. That the, the expansion of God's mercy, just like what we saw in Hosea or with, with Isaiah as the prophecies go out, as a remnant was saved, 
so too the amazing work that took place here is that, that here, now God is including in his work of grace and his work of mercy, the, the Gentiles are included in that. But the only way that, that that work can be received, the same way it was from the very beginning all the way through the very end, is only going to be by faith. It is not by us trying to earn our way to God. And that's what he's telling them. This is the amazing portion of Christian doctrine that scholars, that commentators, that pastors, that everyday Bible students have a hard time of going through chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans because it's like, (laughs) done. (laughs) But I'm going away with a lucky highlighter, so I'm feeling better. (laughs) Yeah, all of that. And if you're confused, well, praise the Lord that you're going to heaven. May the Lord explain it to you. That's the chapter, and that's as deep as we're going to get. Now, uh, now maybe I should add another caveat or a little side note, and uh, it might get us into a whole other fight, but hey, what's church without a good fight, you know? Um, <laughs> thank you for being humorous with me. <laughs> um, listen, there are a lot of people that get on the, 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 the bandwagon uh, of both sides of this track, if you will, of predestination and election and the fights begin to blossom out and all that stuff. And I've got some guys over here and I got some guys over here, Calvin Arminius and all of that stuff. Okay, 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 great, awesome, have fun, whatever. Listen, uh, getting into the wrestling match over this is like trying to get into the wrestling match over um, the Trinity. Ha, there it is. Well, it's not in the Bible. No, you're right. That word is not in the Bible. Okay, great. Next question. Let's move on. Listen, trying to explain the Godhead to somebody, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. They talk to themselves. And now what does this look like? Well, here's what we'll do. We're going to use the analogy of water. Hey, you know, the, the Godhead is like water. Sometimes it's ice. Sometimes it's a little misty. And sometimes it's a, it's a substance of water. Well, that works good, but it breaks down here. Well, then let's use, a, let's use an atom, okay? The Godhead is like an atom, Okay, a proton, a neutron, and the Holy Spirit, it's an electron bouncing around everywhere and all of these things. It's like, okay, they're just analogies of trying to help us to understand something that is far beyond our ability to comprehend. And so too, when it comes to this element of predestination and election, I have it in Romans. Uh, we have it in Romans. We have it in the book of Ephesians chapter one. We have it in uh, uh, 1 Peter 5 towards the end of the chapter. We have all of these things that are laced out within there. And, and, and you know what? If great scholars can come to the table and they can put a particular position in there and yet they can walk away and say, I'm still not sure exactly how all of this works out and exactly how to explain it. I will say, fight if you must. I think it's stupid. Stop fighting. Let's love Jesus and and let him sort it out when we get there, okay? It's a lot, okay? It's huge. It's like, whew, goodness. Um, uh, Maybe I should read a Bible verse or something. Um, (laughs) Listen, what does he say? Uh, I don't know even know if this is a good Bible verse. I can't even find the Bible verse now. It's in 1 Corinthians. I know that. It's in chapter 1. Um, I just love to find them. So now I'm all stubborn up here trying to find the verse. Oh, there. Maybe that's it. Uh, verse, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. This is a side note. So this is, this is bonus material right here, folks. Paul says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this applies, so, so, so hear us, uh, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Oh, no. Predestination, election, let's fight. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not sure that this is God's way. Listen, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, uh, that each of you says, I am of, a, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of a Christ. And he asked the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's the idea? I'm a Calvinism. I'm an Arminianism. Listen, I want to tell you, I'm neither one. Okay? Uh, but, but, but can I agree with certain aspects in each of the camps? Okay, great, sure, fine. B- yes, But my point is nothing more than this, is I think that that church, we need to be careful because we can get into all of these theological word press fights and we can create enemies of the people that we're called to love. And I think that's where the church has gone historically in over so many different things. Now, I'm not telling you I got it figured out. I don't know. I'm hanging on to the horns of the altar. God, give me mercy. But I'm doing the best that I can to take the cookie jar, as they said, right? You know, what do we want to do with our cookie jars? We want to keep them down low. 
So when your grandkids come over to your house, they can reach in there and they can get one. <laughs> so when you teach the word of God, by and large, what do you want to do? Listen, I'm not going to solve every theological problem here on Sunday morning. We don't have the depth of time and the mixture of the room is many people have walked with God for a long time and you got, you've studied some of this stuff out and you've got a good solid position. And there's other people here that are just coming to Jesus. Hey, they got saved last week. And here they are at church today. And all this stuff is going right over the head. And if we turn this into the wrong type of focus, then we lose people on both sides of the aisle. Now, I'm not trying to water down doctrinal positions, so please don't misunderstand me in that. I'm merely just trying to encourage you in the faith. And at the end of the time, what Paul did is he expanded God's mercy to include the Gentiles. They were to receive it by faith, but he was pointing and he was sharing with his Jewish brothers all across the Roman Empire, specifically as the letter goes to Rome, this marvelous work of salvation that we've, that we've seen him write, the first eight chapters, so smooth and so good and so yes, yes, yes. He is really baffling their minds as he goes to the past and he lays out the wonderful purposes, promises, and plans, predestination, and the election of God. That's it. And that's all I want to leave you with. He showed his love to us. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We invite you to join us for our regular worship services on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. Oh